My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week is someone I've been looking forward to for a long time. No play on words. This guy is a legend in the Special Forces community. Richard Rick Lamb is a retired command sergeant major with over 40 years of experience executing joint, combined, and interagency special operations. He led soldiers in operations spanning the tactical level to the strategic in over 49 countries across five continents and in six geographic combatant commands. He spent more than 12 years overseas and participated in almost every major combat operation from Operation Eagle Claw through Operation Iraqi Freedom. A member of the USACOM Commando Hall of Fame, the Ranger Hall of Fame, and the Order of St. Maurice. Rick was awarded the Veteran of the Office of Strategic Service OSS Award of Excellence and the USACOM Arthur Bull Simons Award for Lifetime Achievements. In 2021, Command Sergeant Major Retired Lamb received appointment as the Honorary Sergeant Major of the Special Forces Regiment. He currently serves as the Director of Military Relations for the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation, a disabled veteran-run 501c3 nonprofit, and assists Lucos LLC with CONUS-based SOF training exercises. He lives in Tampa, Florida with his wife of 35 years, Hayran, and is a proud father of two grown children. We welcome to the studio Rick Lamb. That was a lot to say, but man... There's so much to encompass about your career. Welcome, sir. Hey, thanks, DJ. It's good to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, so I'm so excited to talk to you. Like we talked about, you've been in every major conflict that I think the United States has ever been involved in. Uh, And it was super interesting to me to just talk to someone that has seen I I would say combat, war, and the progression of the United States change on a almost cellular level. Uh, And it all started with the National Guard. Now, I want to point out something that we talked about before the show and something that I asked you about. And you said that every man you've ever loved or respected always wore a uniform. And I think that holds true to you with as many years as you have doing this and your whole family. So let's talk about that right off the base your family it has a legend behind it. So let's hear about it. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we came from Scotland, I think in the 1850s. And, uh, one of the guys that drug his bags over here was, uh, in the charge of the light brigade in the Crimean war. And, uh, so yeah, that, that was uh, family lore. I think my, uh, uh, one, I think it was his brother that served in the, uh, the, the, the 99th Indiana infantry in uh, the civil war. And then uh, my grandfather served in the uh, in World War One with the. Uh, he actually ran away when he was a young kid, and uh, ended up down in, in uh, Mexico on the Mexican punitive expedition. And uh, when they found out he was underage, they sent him back home, and then he ran away again, and ended up uh, with Pershing over in France on the uh, American Expeditionary Force. And then uh, to hear the story, tell it the um, they got his picture mis- mixed up in Eldora, the little town that he, uh, that he grew up in. And they had his picture in the, um, in the, in the, the, you know, the, the picture of uh, the photo gallery. Right. And they had a little black, uh, crepe across it, which meant that he had died in combat. And my grandma was a young gal and she walked by there and said, such a, such a shame that a handsome young man, uh, you know, died in combat, but it was, uh, they'd had, they'd, <laughs> they'd fixed the wrong picture. So <laughs> he came home on leave. I think he was, he had gone from, uh, uh, from, from Germany to Panama and he was stationed on the canal and, uh, he came home on leave and, uh, they met and fell in love and that was the end of a good soldier. But yeah, his, all three of his kids served and, uh, it, it was, uh, just, you know, my life, the, uh, if you look at on the, on the back of the wall, you know, the, the first piece of kit, I, I collect military kit and the first piece of kit that I collected was, uh, his doughboy helmet and his, uh, protective mask. 
and then uh, his father's um, Kepi from uh, from the Civil War. Well, you know, you bring that up, and when I talked to Stu, he told me that when he was talking about you, when he was first talking about introducing us to each other, that you collected this stuff. And I also thought that, that you know, you put a lot of time into that, too. He said that you buy the tax stamps so that you can make the military weaponry exactly the way it's supposed to be. You pay for all the things. And he said you can spend hours explaining how each uniform is put together, what everything means on it. What was it that drove you to do that? I understand you have a long history in the military, but I mean, this goes a lot deeper than that. Well, actually, and again, the bug was uh, was set when I was a young kid. I mean, the I had uh, back back in that day, you could buy a stack of patches, uh, you know, about uh, four inches thick for a buck, and uh, they were all from World War II, Korea, um, and, and actually, my uncles would send that stuff, you know, back from Vietnam, and uh, so I, so I, I had started collecting a lot of it as a kid. I had uh, every every division patch from World War II. There was about a hundred and some odd on a, on a big board. And uh, again, you know, just everything from pistol belts to, to helmets to you name it. And, and you know, a lot of the shows that were on TV at the time, like Combat, you know, with Vic Morrow, and uh, that's what we played in the backyard. And uh, so you'd, you'd, uh, you'd run through that. But I, uh, I started collecting in, in earnest. And uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd get the boots, I'd get the uniforms, and then... Um, and then I'd get the weapon, I'd make the weapon, and then I'd go out and shoot it. And it gives you a whole new respect for, uh, for those kids that, you know, slogged all over Europe and uh, in the Pacific. Because if, you know, if you've got a Thompson, your uh, you know, submachine gun, and your backup is a, is a 1911, a 45 on your hip and a flap holster, you know, t- today the guys have it uh, to where it's, it's, it's hung and it's slung, and you come up and it's, it's a one, one-hand magazine change, uh, and, and you've, got your, you've got your spare you know, to where you can get to it, you just you just drop and go, and they can transition quickly. You know, either magazine changes, but that Thompson is almost a two-handed magazine change, and if you can't get it clear, you better be you know you, you just drop it, and then you go to a flap holster on your hip, and it just gives you it. You're trying to get up um, a, a muddy hill with these slick bottom boots, and it uh, gives you a whole new respect for that generation of kid that, uh, like I say, slogged across Europe in in, in wool and cotton and steel. In all of the forms of of battle that you've seen, all of the kits that you've seen, the history of battle, who from beginning till now do you think had it the toughest? In in what in what vein? uh... Well, like you said, it gives you a whole new respect of you know when you're trying to slog up a hill. Who who do you think had it the roughest in in combat times? Uh, Just making it through just on on sheer will. Because if you look at like. Uh, World War II and you see the winners that they had there or you look at the Civil War when there was so much like dysentery and disease and all that kind of stuff. Who would you say do you think had the roughest time going through battle? You know, I get, man, I, I tell you, the, uh, the Civil War guys, if you look at some of the uh, some of the calibers on those musket balls and those mini balls and uh, I mean, just a, a, an arm shot. And uh, right. they, they you know, with the with with dysentery and like you said the the gangrene, I mean they're taking that arm and uh, oh, yeah. And then if then if you if you fast forward to the to the Civil War, I mean those poor kids coming out of the trenches, you know they're still trying to fight shoulder to shoulder against machine guns, and just the the horrendous um, you know the injuries, uh, just the facial injuries and everything else because you know medicine had gotten better by then, so they keep their you know, they're keeping the the guys alive longer. But just some of the horrible wounds coming out of the Civil War, you know, and and, uh, and quite frankly, I mean, you know, from Saving Private Ryan to uh, you know the Pacific to uh, Band of Brothers, I mean, they're they're getting they're getting a lot better and just showing, you know, what uh, the chaos that I mean, that, that opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, you know, coming into the beach. If you, yeah, you know, and I've made several trips to Omaha Beach uh, with an old Ranger from uh, Fifth Ranger Battalion, John Ron, and uh, just standing there on that beach, and, and you see how far they had to run. And uh, you know, those those opening seasons, Saving Private Ryan, it just and your heart goes out to those guys because they they all they all went, they all leapt, man. That uh, that that gate came down and they ran. But it, it would be hard to put a uh, to, to put a handle on. I mean, you, you know, just the disease in the Pacific, and uh, you know, more guys were were injured uh, with with disease than than died. But but then trying to hit the beaches, and uh, you see some of the stuff in the Pacific, just. Uh, you know, horrendous firepower and uh, just the, the courage of those kids. 
Well, and the the reason I ask that is because I've talked to a lot of guys on the show, and I've talked to a couple different guys um, that have taken major wounds while they were in battle, uh, either had a leg taken from them or where they've had, um, you know, an extreme injury, but they battled back. Two of the guys that have that I've talked to have even battled back to get into special forces and went back on deployment and things like that. That's, that's unheard of back in the day to, to be able to do that. Like you said, when you get an injury during the civil war, they're taking whatever it is. And and you're looking probably up into the Korean war until medicine started getting very good with the mobile uh, hospitals and things like that. True, um, the, the helicopter, you know, the, the exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, that's what I'm wondering, uh, and and that's why I asked the question because it seems that um, we have made leaps and bounds in progressions of what we can do on the battlefield, and I only see you know bigger things coming down the road. Now, you know we've been at war for twenty plus years right now with everything wrapping up right now, but it seems like the injuries and the abilities that we can do on the battlefield have have just gone you know insurmountable now. Oh, it's crazy. I was talking to the Rangers the other day. They they can actually do blood trans transfusions. Oh, wow. From a, from a Ranger with O blood and uh, into another Ranger. So they they've got the, the universal donors already tagged and they could do a uh, they could do a transfusion right there on the battlefield from one man to the other. And uh, they actually and they'll and they'll line them up. I mean, there was uh, one kid that uh, had lost both his legs, I think, and uh, in first Ranger battalion. And I can't remember how many times he had just bled out, but they kept, uh, they just kept blood coming into him. You know, next they, they, uh, they'd use one guy, get him out next man. And, uh, and they kept him alive in, uh, that's to, in, to get that's, him back and actually get surgery. He's alive today. That's uh that's crazy that that's even possible. When you were doing things like this, did you ever see something? Did you ever believe something like that could be possible? Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 I could see steady improvement. And uh, and it is neat, like studying the the, the Vietnam guys, and uh, the, the SOG, the the Studies and Observation Group. Yeah, you know, they would take um, uh, canteen pouches. So they'd take you know five twenty round magazines and uh, and one thirty round magazine, and uh, they'd run four of these in, the, in one pouch. And they'd run four or five of these pouches around their belt, and uh, you know made for canteens, but they'd load it up with ammo. So that uh, the, the, your, your, your standard basic load is about 210, 220 rounds. But they would take upwards of 720 rounds. Wow. And uh, so I asked the one, the one guy, I said, isn't that a little excessive? And he said, no, I was, I was on my last 20 round magazine in, in, in one of the fights. And he said, everybody was wounded at 100%, 100% casualty rate. But uh, I mean, they would shove, uh, like, like they would wear um, you know, a cravat around their neck and uh, which you could either sling or, or use as, as wadding, stuffing, or a, or a tourniquet. One on their head. They'd have uh, they'd have bandages placed in their ammo, um, you know, their ammo pouches. One taped to the sling. I mean, so he, even back in that day, they knew that uh, you know guys bled a lot, and you had to you had to shove those, uh, you know, stop the bleeding. But, to, but you know, from just the uh, just the basics, the ABCs that an infantryman learns now to what say they do in the Ranger Regiment to where, uh, I mean, you've, you've got uh, every man does his initial self aid before the medic even gets to you. And I think that's a big thing. That's not only in military now, but that's in law enforcement where there's a lot of teaching, um, of one arm tourniquets where you can get it with one hand sure. and get your tourniquet on. I mean, that's a, I think that's a big thing that has changed. I mean, when you, I even remember back when I went through basic and you know, that was in 94, but they were still talking about when you get a tourniquet and to put a T on the head and it's pretty much a, a, it's pretty much a, you know, a, a a gone cause if you do that. And now they're like, no, you can battle back from that. You can still stay in the fight with your tourniquet wrapped on. And it's amazing. The, the uh, abilities that have come just over time and the, I guess the study of the science of war to make these guys more proficient out on the field. You know, and that's what I, that's what I noticed too with the, uh, with the kit is, um, you know, when we're at war, innovation is up, you know, the guys are thinking about it. I mean, they're learning the lessons and then, and then you'll see when we, when we come out of war, it'll kind of peak and, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll steady. Sometimes it actually backslides. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite uniforms is the, uh, the old, we call it the pickle suit. It's the old OG 107. 
and it came out in 1951. And uh, so you would thought after, you know, three, four years of World War II, to where the paratroopers had the uh, the leg pockets on the side, they had, you know, top pockets on the breast, they had them around their, uh, you know, down on their, their, their waist as well. They would actually have the riggers take um, old waist pockets and sew them on the sleeves like, like the guys have today. And uh, so, you know, pocket for everything. I mean, so you could, you could put three days of rations and water and everything and carry that, carry that with you. Um, the, the, the M I think those were the M 42. So the, the ones that they came out when in 41 also had large cargo pockets on the legs. So world war two ends in 1951 rolls around and, uh, they go to just a set of trousers with patch pockets on them and, uh, and you tuck the shirt in and, uh, they put a big brass belt buckle on it. And, uh, then you have all the colored patches and, you know, the big sleeve, you know, yellow sleeve rank and, and all the multicolored patches and, and we kept that until 1965, 66. And that was the uniform the guys wore to Korea. And uh, you'd have you'd have a pair of a, a garrison set and, and a set for the field. And the garrison set, you would sew the pocket flaps down and then starch it so that they wouldn't peel up. And uh, so you, you, you just saw the difference in the mindset and the, and the backsliding that goes on between a garrison force and a, and a fighting force, you know, a field force. And, uh, and, and that every, you know, time and time again, history shows us that, uh, you lose that quickly. I mean, you can lose it within five years. Well, and, uh, yeah. and that was going to be my next question. Do you think that is because they're thinking optimistically like, Hey, that war is over. That was the war to end all wars. We can go and we can change this. Or do you think it's just a short memory? I think it's a little of both. The, um, uh, you know, and, and I, I love the Vietnam guys. I mean, that, um, uh, yeah, I was, I was a young kid when, when Vietnam was going, but I had, both my uncles were over there in 66. And, uh, so I'm watching the nightly news and I'm, I'm straining to see if I could, you know, as a young kid, I'm thinking I could see my, one of my uncles coming off of a helicopter. <laughs> and, uh, so they, uh, but, uh, you figure, and, and the history is, I mean, people that we don't study history, we don't, uh, we don't, we don't remember it. And then if you don't, if you don't remember it, you're doomed to repeat it. And I, I can remember I came in, uh, when I joined the guard, I think I was in between my, uh, my junior and senior year of um, high school. And, uh, so it's, uh, it was, it was 1976 and, uh, so I graduated in 77. So my uncle was a platoon sergeant down at the local armory and he had a recon platoon. And, uh, so they, they, you know, as a, as a, she was a 17 year old kid. I'm now, you know, I'm, I'm like the mascot. So I go down to the armory and I had a, I had a pair of uh, Vietnam vintage, you know, ERDL camouflage and the jungle boots and had a full complement of kit. And, uh, I can remember, so this is probably 76 and, uh, we went up to Fort McCoy in Wisconsin and, uh, everybody in that platoon were old Vietnam vets. We had a couple of, uh, recon Marines. We had uh, a couple of Rangers. We had an, uh, an SF guy. And, uh, so we're going to get ready to go do a patrol. And so we're, uh, we're up at, uh, we're in this GP medium tent and, uh, the, the, the flaps are rolled up. And so we're inside and, uh, we, we just done our, we had taped and tied everything and made sure that nothing was shining. You bounce up and down to make sure that it's not, uh, not making any noise. And, uh, so each man gets inspected and, uh, you know, the patrol leader who was the platoon sergeant at the time, the assistant patrol leader was the Lieutenant because uh, he didn't have as much experience as the platoon sergeant. And uh, so they're quizzing every man on what his, his mission was, you know, whether you're point your compass or, or what have you. And uh, so then they would issue you a sandbag and uh, you sat down and you, you know, got uh, your back against the, the, the guy behind you. And uh, so there were two files back to back and uh, you put the sandbag over your head and then they, they rolled the, uh, the, the, the tents, you know, the sides of the tent down. And uh, so it's now pitch black. And uh, so for 45 minutes, they just went through, you know, we're going to, we're going to hit the line of departure. We're going to get counted through the wire. We're going to go out 300 meters. Why 300 meters? Because that's the maximum effective range of the, uh, the weapons on the perimeter. We'll do our security slash listening halt. We'll do, uh, get used to the sound sights and sounds of the battlefield. And then, uh, and then from there, it was just azimuth, direction, distance, critical nav points, change azimuth, azimuth, direction, distance. And so they're just walking through it for 45 minutes from the time we, uh, we leave the wire to actions on the objective to all the way to walk back and then uh, come back in the perimeter and the mission. And uh, the reason we were doing it for 45 minutes 
with the sandbags is because it took 45 minutes for the rods and the cones in your eyes to adjust to the darkness of the battlefield. And so we're doing it during the last 45 minutes of daylight. So when we hit the line of departure and get counted through, we'll have a 45 minute jump on Charlie because his rods and cones are going to be, uh, or still be adjusted. And that was the Vietnam guys. I mean, just, you know, totally serious and dedicated. The, it was, uh, that's what I first learned not to trust the media because everything that you're reading on the news that you're seeing in the movies that you're, uh, it, it was the, you know, the, the heroin addicted, um, you know, baby killing, you know, bayonet stabbing. And, and I never, I never met a Vietnam guy that just was not totally switched on and, uh, and, 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 a, and a master of his profession. Why do you think that was though? If, if you, think about that because you're right like the movies the news they all said stuff like that now i have to believe that that at that time national guard these guys are coming back they still want to give to their community to their country because they're staying national guard when they come back a lot of people still have True. you know regular jobs and stuff but they stayed switched on the first part of that question is why do you think that was at that time which you don't really see with National Guard and stuff these days, you see people that are kind of dipping their toe in the water to see if they like the military life. Uh, so that's the first part of the question. And then the second part is, with these guys that you trained with, these Vietnam vets, these National Guard guys, do you think that gave you a, a gigantic leg up when you went active? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, in fact, it was coming. I think it was after that mission. The um, you know, they, they sat me down and said, hey, listen, they just started the Ranger Battalions up again. And uh, I think they started them two years earlier in 74. And uh, they said, you need to go active on active duty and uh, go to one of the Ranger battalions. And uh, and so, again, I, I run right into uh, Dave Grange, who's like the father of the modern day Ranger. And, uh, you know, when they stood the battalions up in uh, in 74, and uh, there was a thing called the Abrams Charter. It was Creighton Abrams who, who set them up. And uh, he wanted them to be the best light infantry, bar none on the planet. And um, if you do one year in the in the Ranger Battalion, it's it's like doing three anywhere else because the uh, you're going to go to Panama, you're going to jump into Panama, and you're going to work the jungle. You're going to go to jungle school. Um, you're going to go up to uh, either Minnesota or one of the northern or, or Alaska, and you're going to do your winter stuff. You're going out west to 29 Palms in the desert. You're going to do your desert. You're coming to uh, to Florida. I mean, so it was just you know every quarter you're going. Uh, you're going somewhere and all your bags are packed and you're actually, you got to like a boot of the month club where you're, uh, you're either in your vapor barrier boots or you're doing your jungle boots or you're doing your, uh, your, your winter boots that, uh, and making sure that they all fit your feet and you're ready to go. And, uh, it was just so that the Abrams charter was you do three years in the Rangers and then you go back out into the army and then you, uh, you, you, you teach the army what you learned in the Rangers. And that was the, uh, the Abrams charter. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, an amazing time. Uh, but again, it was the, the Vietnam guys that, uh, that built those battalions, that, you know, turned those two battalions into three, which turned it into a Ranger regiment. And, uh, you know, guys like Grange and just uh, you know, Spencer, I mean, all these, these hard um, Vietnam vets, you know, they built the, uh, they, they had closed down all but two of the uh, special forces groups. And uh, so it was those Vietnam vets that rebuilt. Why those. was that, Rick? Um, I think it's, uh, like you said, when the, the, the war's over, you know, you wave the flag and it's like, woo, Hey, we won that one. And now it's time to take that money that we've been wasting and, uh, and, and throw it towards something else. So we're going to, you're going to see the same thing. We do it every time. And, uh, you know, whether we stood down the, cause you figure, you know, the, probably the, one of the best armies that we had ever fielded in, uh, 19, you know, 41 through 1945, it was that world war two generation. And within five years, the, uh, most of those combat vets had gotten out and gone back to you know, their lives. New, new kids have come in. And uh, so they sent um, Task Force Smith out of Korea, or, or out of um, um, Japan, rather, who were on you know, um, basically occupation duty in Japan with no, no areas to train and uh, you know, no training to speak of. And they sent them up against uh, you know, North Korean dirt farmers driving Soviet tanks. And uh, they lasted just a matter of hours before they were hot footing it down to down to uh, the Pusan perimeter, and that was only within five years. So you see, um, you see the uh, you see that happen every time, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll go for the the peace dividend they call it. In fact, the uh, No More Task Force Smith was the the video that you had to watch and then sign 
like in the early nineties, because they were, uh, they went from 20 divisions down to 10 and they said, we're going to, it's going to be a smart cut. We're going to be able to fight two theater wars and then another, another theater skirmish. And as you're looking through that, you're going like, man, they're smoking crack. There's uh, there's no way <laughs> with the amount of people that, that, that you're going to leave us. And they'll tell you, well, you know, the, uh, our, our, our equipment's much better, you know, and our, our weapons are more lethal. So we don't need as many people. And there was some truth to that, but, um, it's, it's always about the peace dividend and we want to get that and spend it somewhere else. And, you know, and that seems like the exact opposite way that they should think when you see the things that you go through during World War II, during Korea, during Vietnam and all the hardships and everything, you would think that they would want to harden their people for the next one, because let's be honest, uh, you've been a warrior your entire adult life. War is inevitable. It's not going away. Conflict is inevitable. It's not going away. So I don't, I guess I don't understand why we don't train for that. We train to train. We don't train for what's coming up. And then we're almost behind the power curve. Yeah. And, and, and we have a, we have a bad, we have a bad history of actually calling it too. I mean, you know, right, right now we're, you know, the clock's ticking on uh, when Israel and Iran are going to fight. And I um, mean, they've, they've really been in little proxy wars back and forth, you know, for a while, for the last couple of years. And every time something blows up in Iran, you know, there's, there's, it's probably got an Israeli fingerprint on it. So the, and the same thing with China. I mean, that, uh, you know, Xi Jinping said he's not going to pass on, you know, the uh, reunification of, of Taiwan to the next, uh, and you've already got South Korea and you've got uh, the, the Japanese who have said, no, we're, uh, we're on the side of Taiwan. So, I mean, there's, uh, you, you got look, Russia look back at the, the, the you know, the, the, the start of world war, world war one, the, uh, I mean, that was just a bunch of, you know, uh, truces and treaties and, uh, mutual defense agreements that, uh, that turned into one of the bloodiest slogs that we've ever had. I mean, you have Europe really never recovered. I mean, they lost an entire generation of world war one. Then you turn around 20 years later, they lose another tire generation in uh, world war two. So we, we just have a bad, uh, um, you know, the, the, I can remember the Iranian hostage rescue mission in 80, right? The, um, so we were, we were Rogers Ragers and, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the tactics had not changed, you know, from raid recon ambush and, uh, we're out in the swamps Monday through Friday and, uh, you know, doing patrol base activities and, and just getting our raids on. And I remember, uh, then. Captain Grange called us into the, the, the day room and uh, you know, they used to have a day room with a pool table and a foosball table and it was a place where you know, the guys could just go and kind of let their hair down. And uh, so he wanted to know who the best snipers were, who the um, who actually owned Jeeps and uh, you know, like CJ5s, who, um, who grew up on farms and knew how to run equipment, um, who rode motorcycles, uh, both on road and off road. And he just, uh, who, were, who were the best snipers, the best machine gunners. And he retask organized the company based on based around vehicle movement because we were all foot powered prior to that and we got these old um um m53 jeeps you know those old uh, like world war ii korea war right. vintage vietnam vintage and uh we, we had to figure out how many how many rangers can we put on this before it uh, gets the unsafe with the center of, center of balance do we leave the windshields on do we take them off you know, how are we going to, uh, you know, how are we going to put this stuff, what, who goes where, what gets lashed down, how are we going to put more guns on it? How are we going to get it onto a, either a helicopter or onto an airplane? And, uh, you know, when it's on the airplane, when do you take the chains off? You know, when do you test start the engine? How do you get it off the ramp? And, uh, just all that, uh, you know, so they, they work through all of those tactics, techniques, procedures. What if you can't land, you've got to have a jump team. So the jump teams, they, they, they've got to come on either side of the Jeeps, get out of the doors and uh, jump out, clear the airfield, and then we can land uh, the vehicles. It was, it was a great time to be alive. But the, the, that whole mission, uh, there, there, was, there were some subtle nuances to putting an Army Ranger on an Air Force helicopter and then taking that Air Force helicopter on and off of a carrier deck, and uh, which you know, they didn't have the, uh, the, the ability to land or you know, all, the, all the qualifications. So then they had to go with the... Uh, the Navy birds, but uh, but the Navy birds were sub hunters, and they they weren't used to flying you know nap of the earth, so they had to put the marine pilots in it. I mean, none of the radios talked, the um, none of the soft had worked together because they were all you know part of their different services. So 
it just uh, you know, it was it was almost destined to fail. They they damn near pulled it off, and uh, just because of the quality of the people they had. But um, and so you, uh, the Holloway Commission, as they looked at the uh, what went wrong, you know, he said, hey, if you want to do this again, you're going to need a command and control. You're going to need a, uh, a, a an ability to to man, train, equip. You know, like a service like responsibility. You're going to need a um, the, the ability to train these guys, you're going to need a budget. And uh, so they made these recommendations to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. And then uh, I want to say about four to six years later, you know, Nunn, uh, Sam Nunn and uh, Cohen, I can't remember Cohen's name, but the Nunn-Cohen Amendment to the National Security Act said, you know, they legislated the U.S. SOCOM into existence. And uh, so, you know, the DOD is never going to figure it out. It, uh, it goes back to the it took them a long time to give up horses. It's going to take them a long time to give up tanks. <laughs> so the, uh, you would actually, you we're, we're at the point now where, you know, the aircraft too, it'll take a long time to give up aircraft, but there's, there's, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles out there that can, that can pull G's that a human body can't. And, uh, you know, so the, the technology is just, uh, it's just, just that good. So they, you know, they're working the humans out of the job. Well, let's talk about uh, Eagle Claw for a minute. Uh, this was the first um, real story about your career. This was the, the I would say, the first time that you're um, really in combat, actual combat. Would that that be correct to say, correct? Yeah, but I didn't get shot at, so it wasn't really combat. Okay. It was, it was, it was the first you know, actual mission, I guess. First actual mission. There we go. Okay. Uh, and, and for people that don't know, uh, November 4th, 1979, 3,000 militant students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. They took 63 Americans hostage, uh, three additional members of the U.S. diplomatic staff. Now, what was interesting was they released 13 of the hostages, all African-American, uh, yeah, African-American or women, and then left 53 hostages. Uh, April 1980. Uh, they had 53 hostages still waiting for failed negotiations. So this plan is put into effect, this two-day plan to get these guys out of there. Uh, but it, it, like you said, it was almost doomed to fail from the beginning because it was, to me, reading about it was so ambitious and so grand. It doesn't seem to me, and you can say better, like they had the finite details ready. No, and, and, and probably the biggest, the Achilles heel of the whole thing was the compartmentalization of it. And uh, they never brought the entire force together to do an entire dress rehearsal. I mean, even for our part with the Rangers, you know, we had, um, we had, uh, yeah, we had to season hold terrain. And uh, so we would take target cloth and we'd make these big buildings that, uh, that were the size and dimensions of the, uh, the buildings that we're going to attack in, uh, in the, in the compound there. And, uh, but then you would have to, uh, and so you're using four by four posts, you know, post hole diggers and you're putting the posts in there and you're putting the target cloth up so that you can, uh, you know, build it to scale and, and take it. And the reason they used target cloth was the, uh, so they could take it down because the Soviet satellites would come over at certain times. And we had to have that field where we just built the objective. We had to have it cleared to include little patches of grass that we'd put back on <laughs> so that they couldn't look at it and, and figure out what we were doing. You know, the reason they didn't take the Air Force birds, the Air Force birds were much better helicopters, but uh, the blades didn't fold back. So uh, you know, the, the, the big, um, so they had to use Sea Stallions instead of the uh, MH-53s because they would have had to put the MH-53s, the Air Force birds, on the carrier deck and, uh, and steam that thing over. And then, again, the Soviet satellite would come over and they'd, they'd see all the vehicles, or the, the, the helicopters, so they knew we were up to something. And uh, so it was just working through all that. I and mean, we... Uh, they had to put that thing together uh, on the fly, and uh, they they and then they never really rehearsed the entire thing. And we, we would do it um, within our within our little stovepipe, and we were constantly we we'd fly for hours, and the, the birds would land, and you'd stumble off the back because your legs were asleep. But uh, it was it was a, it was a great time. To, the innovation was just off the charts because you had to have everything from uh, from task organization. To load plans, to vehicle load plans, to aircraft load plans, to the time warnings, and uh, you, we didn't have the technology that we have today, where every man has a radio. You know, you had those big Motorola bricks, and only a few would have them. So the uh, and I mean, even the night vision was uh, that first generation, the PBS fives. We didn't have enough of those as well, and uh, so just trying just accountability. We're using little hand golf um, golf counters as uh, as the guys were coming up the the, the ramp. 
and uh, you would you would count them, and then you go back. You have a big piece of acetate, and uh, which would glow, and um, and a um, one of those china markers that uh, you know the wax china markers, and then you go through there and you get uh, you know your first count, second count, third count, and then relay that back and forth. And uh, I mean, heaven forbid if you were missing a guy, and uh, you'd, then you'd have to sit there with the blades turning, and uh, to try to, to find, find him. him. <laughs> there was no way that you'd leave him behind. So they actually took the airfield that they were supposed to, but then everything kind of starts going off the rails. Um, yeah, and actually it started in the movement. They had the, I think they call them haboos, and uh, it was a big sandstorm. Okay. So um, so initially they, they got kind of misoriented in the sandstorm. And again, you got some Air Force guys, some Marine guys, some Navy guys, and uh, they aren't. They're, none of them are flying their own birds. And uh, so it, 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 in those type of circumstances, and uh, so I think they get they get split, um, they they get lost, they get back, they they land on the ground, and I think at that point the uh, one of the one of the birds goes down. It's uh, and that's where the back and forth between you know like the the Air Force right. guys we're not flying, and the Marines are like hey, we'll fly anything, and uh, the <laughs> Army guys are like mm, we're agnostic. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the uh, one guy said just put a piece of tape over the light, and uh, it won't bother you. But uh, so so they lost one bird. And uh, based on the, the daylight conditions, you know, they'd already, it was already indexed to, uh, they said, no, we, can, we can't do it. We have to leave this bird on the ground and we're, you know, we're going to, we're, we're pulling out. So the mission, it was already scrubbed before the, uh, before anything blew up. And so what are they telling you on the ground? Because uh, that was part of your job was the airfield, correct? Uh, actually, there was, there was two. There was, um, you had the desert one dirt strip. Okay. Which um, would had uh, had, a, had a small complement of rangers with uh, with uh, motorcycles, and and that was another thing too is the uh, um, it was a dirt strip, but it was also a road, and uh, I mean who who knew that uh, that there would be a bus and a tanker out there? Uh, yeah, they had to take like forty people morning. hostage. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> so they had to stop that and uh, then keep them on the ground. And, uh, but it was just, uh, so, so that, that kind of, that, that went, uh, my, the, the, the airfield that I was on was uh, Mansaria, that the mission that I was on rather okay. was, uh, because there, there was two airfields, there was the infill and really it was just a gas point. The, the initial, uh, place there called desert one, that was just to, to, to gas them up. And then, uh, because they didn't have, um, the ability to do in-flight refuel. Right. And, uh, you know, like, like they do now, that was one of the things they fixed. And uh, they were going to gas them up there in the desert, then take off, and then they had to remain overnight uh, for the remainder of the night in the mountains. And then in the, you know, the following period of darkness, they'd, they'd come out of the mountains and then uh, come into the city. So that was like just the, the first stop to, to take on fuel. Meanwhile, we're, uh, we're still over at, um, in, in Egypt getting ready at the, uh, the, you know, the forward base there, getting ready to go out because we, uh, we actually had 141s with us, you know, the, the, the jet air. Because once once they take the embassy, get the hostages, get them out of the city, they had to take them to uh, to Mansaria or Mansaria, and uh, that was an all weather strip where they could bring in C one forty ones, you know, the jet aircraft, just to load them as that. fast as possible. Exactly, because they, they had to take them all the way to Germany. Okay, you know th- those were, those were the legs that, uh, that that they were looking at, and again, it had never been done before, uh, and I tell you, they they came they didn't came damn close to pulling it off. Even uh, even as clunky as it was. Well, that's what I want to ask you about. So, with the helicopter colliding with the C one hundred and thirty, what what seemed to be the problem there? Because I guess some were trying to leave, the other one was trying to come in at the same time. Or, or I, I, yeah, they, I think they, you can explain it better than I read it. So, yeah, I think it was. Um, again, you had to get the because uh, the the C one hundred and thirty had a big old tank of gas in it. Right, and uh, so that was that was the gas station. So the, uh, the 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 helicopter had to go over and land near the gas station. So they got to run out with the uh, with the line and plug it in and top him off, and then he, he could get out of there. Yeah, uh, but what what they what they theorize is that um, in brownout conditions, as the uh, as, you know, you lose you lose the vision of the bird, and they theorize that as the as the one kid was trying to bring the the helicopter close enough in to land it that. Um, you know, he got blown back, and uh, so as he's 
gets blown back, then the, the bird just kept kept going and flew right into it. Oh, man. And so what do they tell you guys? After all this happens, what do they tell you? Because you're, um, you know. Yeah, they come back. We, we had to go back to Egypt. We sterilized everything and, uh, you know, to try to make it so there was at least some degree of deniability on uh, who all was there. And uh, and then we we go back to the States, but we we still continue to, to train. Train, yeah. Because it wasn't over at that point. That was just like phase one. I think um, Honey Badger was, uh, was, was phase two. And Honey Badger was a much larger force. And that was, uh, that was actually, okay, we're going to go in. We're going to, uh, you know, more like the guys would do today. We're going to seize the air, airfield in Tehran. We're going to do a thunder run out to the embassy. You know, we'll, uh, we'll line the sides of the street. And uh, basically, we're just going just gonna to go in there and slug it out. And because uh, the first one, we were, we were, it was the, the minimum force, the optimal force to try to get in, get out with the, uh, the least amount of, um, you know, collateral damage and carnage. Uh, the second one was uh, Thunder Run, and which, which I had a lot of respect for, for Carter to continue to plan that. Well, well, let me ask you, because you trained for like up to almost a year after that, yeah, right? It was about a year. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when when you're doing that and you say that, you know, they're, they're trying to sterilize everything to show that maybe not everyone was there. So what are the statements that we make? Because like you said, you couldn't even train over there without being able to tear down the buildings quickly, put the grass back into place. So the satellites. So when you have aircraft and all this kind of carnage on the ground, how do you talk that one away? Oh yeah. 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 I, I don't think there was any, uh, any, so, so I think you know, when you're trying to sterilize, there, there was no sterilizing on, on the ground there in Desert One. I'm, I'm talking about back at the, the, the sites where we'd launched out of. I, okay, we had, okay. Uh, we, we'd gone through Oman. We'd gone through um, uh, the Wadi. I can't remember the, the place in, the, in Egypt. So any, any of those places so that uh, you know, the, the Omanis and the Egyptians wouldn't get, a, wouldn't get a finger in the eye for helping us. Well, uh, yeah, I, it, it, it's always amazed me how we do diplomatic relations, especially in something like that. Cause that's a, a very large operation to just kind of try and sweep under the, you know what guys, we're going to go back. We're going to try this again. We're going to come back over here. Um, but like you said, for Carter to continue to keep that resolve is amazing for, for that administration to keep the resolve that they did in the beginning after all that had happened over there. Yep, I, I thought so too. Because the, uh, the I'm not, I'm not. You know, I, I try not to be political, but uh, yeah, the uh, there were, there was a lot of dumb decisions being made. But uh, for for him to stick to that one, I, I thought. Uh, I mean, because I, I thought, he, I thought he'd do well. Yeah. That was kind of his calling card was to talk to other countries and to be kind of the voice of reason with other countries and stuff. So to, you know, continue to plan an operation to take back our people is. It's a lot to say for that, you know. Uh, you can't say that a, a lot of times. So yeah, let's yeah, later in years, I was in Panama, and uh, you, know, you could just see the slow decline, you know, from the Carter Trios. Um, it was they were given as we were leaving the Panama Canal, uh, to the point of where I, yeah, I was talking to um, some of the Seventh Group guys, and that that was such a that was such a great lily pad into Latin America. And uh, the, the 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 people there, it's it's one of those uh, one of those things where the, the people that we we lived with and worked with, you know, the Panamanians, they liked the Americans being there, and uh, yeah, we we were we were quite a boon to the, to the local economy as well, and uh, so they, they they didn't mind us being down there. You know, we protected the uh, we had a jungle school there, that um, so that the would which we've yet to replace really. I mean, I think they're trying in Hawaii, but you know, it's it's hard to replace that triple canopy rainforest that you find in Panama. Well, I was stationed uh, in Hawaii at the 25th where they're, where they have that jungle school now. And that's, I'm pretty sure they're putting it out in East range over there, which it's good. But like you said, it's not a Panamanian jungle. It's a, it's, it's good ground to work on, but it's no Panamanian jungle. What? So we, you're talking to the seventh group guys. They're looking at, um, you know, do we, go back to one of the old air bases down there, like let's say at Howard or, or down to Sherman. Uh, Cause the infrastructure has been, you know, we've been out of there for 20 years, so it's going to need quite a bit of work, but um, you know, how do you get that? Cause if you look at, um, I was down there in the eighties, right? 
And, right. Uh, so Nicaragua had already gone, you know, communist. You know, they were uh, they were a, a you know socialist state. But you saw Bolivia, Peru. You saw a lot of those go. I mean, Colombia was um, they were on the brink of becoming the first narco state. And uh, but the ability to to have forces in Panama, have that lily pad, have the ability to to then you know have the relationships with. Yeah, you know, with uh, with Colombia, with Venezuela, with Peru, with uh, Bolivia, uh, it was it was yeah. You know, we built their um, their special forces, and we had great relationships with them, and uh, it, it, there was a degree of stability. So, that, but you know, by the time I left, I think in '90, I want to say that was uh, Ortega had had left. I mean, so all the uh, all the hard work that we did uh, down there, you know, e- even Nicaragua had become more democratic. And uh, so having us in theater and having those relationships and having the ability to, to, to live with them was, uh, yeah, I, I, that I always second guess that, uh, you know, the giving up, giving up, I, I think we gave that up too easy. Well, and I, I think it goes back to the same thing that you said, not only this country, but other countries have short memories and they don't. I don't, I'm not sure that they're always thinking about that stuff. Like you said, living down there and you see it every day and it's part of your life. That's one thing you pull out and there's people moving around that don't want that lifestyle. Who's going to be your influence? The people that are talking in your ear constantly or the guys that used to live there? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and as we moved out of Rodman there on the Pacific side, the Chinese moved in right behind us. Uh, we moved out of Coca Solo on the, uh, on the, uh, the Atlantic side, the Chinese moved in right behind and uh, so the, you know, the Chinese, I mean, they're, they're uh, it, we, it's just, it's just we, we don't know history. I mean, it's been at least a decade. Yeah, they were they were pretty instrumental in getting the uh, the Panama Canal widened because you had these the big Panamax ships, but uh, it was old technology, you know, from uh, 1904, 1914, I think is when they actually opened it. And uh, so so they were they were they were pushing, helping to bankroll the uh, another set of locks. Uh, there, there's three sets of locks, but they wanted another another pathway uh, beside each one of the locks to where you can get a post Panamax ship. And the post Panamax ships are huge, and I mean you can actually put factories on them and do a lot of your building on the uh, on the transit over. And uh, so so now they have you know those post Panamax locks set up. Chinese are building the post Panamax ships. Quite a bit of the stuff is coming from Asia, so. Uh, we have very few ports up in the United States that, uh, that will take a post Panamax ship. And, uh, and, and we've yet to get an infrastructure plan through that'll, uh, that'll help you know, get some of these ports to the point of where they can take these huge ships. So in theory that the Chinese could though, cause then they built the railhead from Panama through Colombia down into South America. So they, they could cut us out of all of the Western hemisphere trade just by virtue of the fact that the ships can't dock at the ports. And, uh, so, you know, there's, there, there's people playing, uh, you know, playing chess to our checkers. It seems like, well, and that, that's the big thing with, with China, that seems to be one of our main problems. And it's not that we're going to go to war with them. Uh, when Stu and I talked, we talked about cyber warfare and a lot of different True. things that we're looking yeah. at with these guys. I mean, like you said, chess to checkers, these guys are looking to, bankroll and when you said we can't even get the infrastructure to put this stuff in here they're going to go to every country that they can bankroll to get that infrastructure not only are they building allies but they're building bases of operation yeah actually you know i was in djibouti for a while and they they moved in right after us so the uh you know, they've, they've got uh, a port in africa now too well and it's they, uh again they, they've got a long-term plan Yeah, you know, the uh it just seems like uh you know, we We'll look at it. We'll do something about it. Then we go right back to navel gazing. Look at our navel. <laughs> Pick at the lint. <laughs> so let's move on to North Korea. I want to talk about that. We can quickly talk about Bright Star. Um, I the interesting thing that I thought about Bright Star was that still they're still doing it to this day, um, and the reasons. Not necessarily why they did it originally, because uh, Anwar al-Sadat was assassinated, but this was set in place way before that ever happened. But it actually kicked off the day that was kind of finishing up the uh, memorialization of him. Uh, And they still do it. So 
I, I just wanted yeah, to talk about actually you know, having having a, a, a Schwarzkopf was um, a genius. I mean, he was uh, again another Vietnam guy. But uh, when he took over the 24th Infantry Division, there was two active duty brigades, and uh, and there was one uh, National Guard roundout brigade, right? So for for the three brigades for that division, so he activated the third brigade and uh, brought them to Fort Stewart and had first and second brigade train the third brigade. He even took them out to uh, the National Training Center in uh, in California and fought them. So they they got um, they got their stamp of approval that yes you know you have you have uh come in mustered trained and you're ready to go to combat so uh, so he did that first thing off the bat and then he uh and then he took the first brigade and uh, he put he put them on on rail and took them all the way down to the uh the, the port there in uh, uh savannah because they're, they're at fort uh they're at fort um, stewart so he took them to savannah put them on a big ocean going ship and, and shipped them off to bright star he took the second brigade and uh, he drove him down to Brunswick, and uh, Brunswick he he had the the big on off boats that would come in, and the whole front of it opens up, and then you can drive the drive the stuff off the beach. So he put the second brigade on those ships, and then he hit Index. And for the third brigade, he took them all the way down to uh, to Jacksonville, and uh, they cleared out one of the one of the ports. And he just parked them there. He didn't go and actually load them on the ships, but he wanted to see how long it would take him to get all three of his brigades into the fight. And the nice thing about first brigade heading off to Egypt was uh, once they got there, I mean, they built at Cairo West, they, uh, they, they built a, a, a camp. And uh, so you had a, a, an entire, you know, full up you know, brigade task force in Egypt right after Sadat, uh, Sadat had been, been killed. And they were happy to have that. I mean, that that was, I think, something that that just stabilized. And then we, then we worked, um, you know, for weeks just with the, our Egyptian counterparts, and because uh, they had all all Soviet gear. And uh, so that yeah, Bright Star, and and, and I think that kind of sent a message too that you know we can we can get there, and uh, we can set up. And they, uh, that's the first time I had seen something that big go into a uh, a camp that was you know days before was in the middle of the desert, and when everything from uh, from chow halls to to latrines, to, you know, mass units, to, to you name it. Yeah, it ended up being like, what, like 9,000 soldiers, something like that, all together? Well, yeah, it was, it was incredible, yep. yeah. Yeah. Um, let me ask you something about that part of the world. You know, you <clears throat> you talked about that they were happy to have us there after that had happened. Uh, we, we set up, we established, we have good relations we don't really have anything um, kind of cemented there anymore. We fight a lot in the Middle East, but do you think it's a good idea to maybe base out of these countries? And, and you know, the politics may have changed since then. We still do this exercise and stuff, but don't you think it's a good idea to base out of these countries that actually want us there, that have tourism, that have things that they can offer back in return for us being there? We don't really seem to take advantage of that. No, and and, and I've always been a proponent. I've, I I served in First uh, Battalion, Tenth Group, and uh, you know, they they've been over there since probably 1952, and uh, in Germany. And uh, initially, they started out in Bad Tolz. They're now uh, more in the the Berber and Stuttgart area. But um, and and they had, uh, I mean, they were part of the they were part of the town, part of the culture. And uh, I, I, I always, uh, same thing in Panama. We spent like six years down in Panama and uh, I mean, we were just part of the culture. We were part of uh, the, and I, I'd, all, I'd often thought that, you know, why we didn't, um, you know, look at like either either Liberia or um, Senegal or even Ghana and uh, send a battalion forward from the third group and, uh, and, and put them in place. And then, and then, like you said, the same thing, put, uh, Put a uh, put a battalion out of the fifth group, and uh, and put them forward because you, you can't you can't buy that network. I mean you can't um, you can't buy that relationship, and, and you can't make those relationships you know, after a crisis has happened. So now they have you know, they have persistent presence through rotational forces, but uh, but it, but it's not the same as living there. Yeah, because it's almost like you know that's the in laws coming for the weekend. Uh, when you have just, a, I mean, I, I hate to use that analogy because most people don't want their in-laws coming, but 
when you when you look at that, that's what the presence is anymore. Yeah, we have a constant presence, but it's more of just rotating through. No one really takes a part of the culture. They don't really take a part of our culture because it's always changing on them, which never gives them kind of a a base or a standard to kind of go on. Yep, and, and we, we've got we've got um, we've got bases that that are like hot spots. The uh, you know, Bahrain. I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of logistics and stuff over there. I mean, there, there's forward deployed, you know, uh, equipment and vehicles, but, uh, but having a, you've got people that maintain it. And then, uh, we, we have, you know, green suitors and blue suitors that just kind of rotate in and out of there. But, uh, but it's, it's not like, um, it's not like I remember Panama or, right. or Stuttgart being. Right. I, I think even Sinai, I think we still have some, but the, it's on a rotating basis over there yeah. too. It's a, I think it's an MFO unit over there. So, um, so let's move on. I want to talk about Korea. Now, this is where you received your silver star. Um, this is a really interesting story and it seems, you know, whenever I'm reading your story and I'm talking to you, it just seems kind of everywhere you went in your career, something popped off. Um, I don't know if that's by design or if that was just, you know, you were in the right place at the right time. But it seems like uh, everywhere you went that this was happening. Um, would you agree with that? Yes, and, and it's a little of both. I mean, I, I probably, when I was younger, I stumbled into it. Uh, but it was like, as I got older, I actually tried to plan my um, assignments, you know, based on where, you know, what was active. And, uh, but yeah, Korea was... Um, I think I, I, I do. I was trying to go to Italy and, uh, there was a three year assignment. It was down at Vincenzo. It was an airborne outfit and uh, they didn't have any slots. So then they said, we'll send you to Germany. And it's like, what three years in Germany. I, I don't think so. What's the shortest tour I can get. And they said, we well, can do one year one in year. Korea. I said, all right, sold. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I go to Korea and, uh, and I was all excited because you know, I, that, you know, being an old, history buff i wanted to wear that indian head patch you know from the uh the second infantry division and so i was in the uh, the repo depot and uh sergeant williams who had been uh in first ranger battalion with me he comes up to uh the the, the rep the repo depot where the replacements would go in and uh him and the first sergeant would would go through all the records of all the the new kids coming in and uh, anybody that had been to jump school or served in the 82nd or served in the Rangers or served, served in special forces, then, uh, they, they would take them and, uh, and get them reassigned up to their unit up in Pan Munjong. And, uh, so he, he Sergeant Williams came in he says, Hey, Rick, you're coming with us. And, uh, so, but I, I thought I was going to two ID. He says, now you're going to like this better. And, uh, so we were like the northern, the northernmost camp. It was camp Kitty Hawk at the time. I think it's been, since been re renamed to camp Boniface. But uh, Camp Kitty Hawk, and I think we had uh, we had the Manchus were up there. We had a company of them uh, over on Liberty Bell, but it was the farthest north that you could get. I mean, the drop gate taking you into the DMZ was was like right out, you know, right right outside the barracks. And uh, it was live patrols, um, you know, either either you know combat patrols out in the DMZ, ambush patrols in the DMZ. We had something going every night, and uh, we had uh, and, and it was all NCO run which, which was awesome. And, uh, you know, great crop of officers. They trusted their NCOs. And I mean, the staff sergeants, the squad leaders made that place hum. And it was just, I mean, it was just like being in ranger school, but you had live ammo you know, to the point where you'd have, uh, you'd have your, you'd get your mission brief, you brief your guys and give them the warning order. They go back, they pack their stuff. You know, you do your, do all your pre-combat checks and uh, do your rehearsals, you know, test fire your guns. And then you're, uh, and while all that's going on, somebody's heading down to, this is pre-computers, so you'd have to go down to uh, to see the, the, the mortar guys and the the artillerymen. And uh, it was an old acetate, you know, plastic acetate overlay in grease pencil. And here's all of our target reference points. Here's our routes. Here's our frequencies, our call signs. And uh, and, and the, the, they'd have the gun bunnies out on the guns. And uh, so as you're moving and you're calling your different checkpoints, you know, they're, they're, they're Adjusting. manipulating the guns and the sights and they're moving along along you so they could get you know rounds out if you ever got in trouble and uh, but just an awesome awesome place to be and uh again bert mrs owl was our company commander 
and uh, old ranger guy, and uh, uh, you know, but the platoon sergeant was an old uh, Dave Merck. He was an old Lima Company ranger from Vietnam, and we we had uh, it was just a good, solid group of soldiers, and we lived up there. We had uh, I think we we were, we were the only guys I think on Peninsula that were guaranteed two days off, but it was like an eight day work week. So you'd have to, you'd work, uh, you'd work six full days and then you'd have two days off. So you never knew what day of the week it was. It was just, you know, wherever you were at in the schedule. And it was anything from uh, man in the checkpoints up in the truce village to, uh, to being on the quick reaction force, to doing the, uh, the combat patrols to, uh, uh, there was two days of actual training where you could go out and, and train as a platoon in your, uh, in the training area. And then you had two days off. So let, let's talk about a little of the background of what's going on, right? Because you talked about Truth Vill- <clears throat> excuse me, Truce Village just now. Let's talk about a little what's going on right now and then the actual event that happened. Because I want people to kind of understand. I don't know that they knew that tensions were this high because they were pretty high back then. I mean, tensions are high now, but <laughs> they, they were, uh, you know, they were pucker factor back then. Yeah, and it was... Um... They had had, uh, an, Koreans are real, they're real picky about their trees, right? Because the, the Japanese had invaded them in like 1904, 1906, and uh, it actually stayed, you know, had occupied uh, Korea uh, till 1945 when, uh, when the Americans and the Soviets came in. And that's, that's how it got split. I mean, the Soviets got, in, got into the, you know, the, the war in the East late. And uh, so, so they, they come running down and we, we ran in real quick and said, whoa, 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 stop. And uh, so we stopped them about the 35th parallel or 38th parallel. We said, we'll take all the surrender of the Japanese to the south of the 38th parallel. You take the surrender of the Japanese to the north. They were supposed to have free elections. Neither side ever did. They dug in wire walls. And then, bam, 1951, the, you know, the, the North Koreans who, would, who were Soviet trained attacked the South Koreans. And then you had this slugfest. So the, the, the Panmunjom was a joint, a joint area where you'd have North Koreans and South Korean soldiers and U.S. and then the neutral nation, Swiss and Swedes, uh, in, in that one truce village until we chopped down a tree and uh, the North Koreans attacked the, uh, the, the group that, was, that had chopped the tree down. And it was, uh, there were two American officers there and uh, they both got killed with axes. And uh, so after that, they, they split the two sides and sent, you know, no North Koreans past this this line, no South Koreans north of this line. And uh, and, and, and it got real tense. And uh, so I think that had happened uh, in 76, maybe. So this About is five what, years later. Yeah, uh, uh, this is around 84, 85 time frame. Yep. Um, and so when, when that happens, how does it go? I mean, tensions have to almost instantly flare then uh, because you guys are, I'm not going to say getting along or anything, but everyone is kind of doing their part there. This happens. uh, It splits the forces and instantly you guys are on alert. So even more than you were, you know, you were going out and everything you're, you're on alert. What are they telling you guys to be watching for? Because this changes how we feel about other countries right away. Oh, true. Yeah. So, so what happened was there was, um, they run tours. I mean, it's, 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 it's an, it's probably one of the oddest places on earth, but the uh, bus loads of, uh, you know, freedom loving people will come in on the South and, uh, and you'll, you'll get a tour of, uh, this is, this is the truce village. This is where they have their talks and, uh, you get to see the, uh, the North Koreans looking through, you know, binoculars, looking at you, looking at them and, uh, and the, and the North does the same thing. So they have, they had a Soviet kid, uh, named Vasily Matusak, who was uh, like an exchange student. And uh, he was over there for his, um, you know, f- for his tour. And he asked his North Korean guard, can I go down into the truce village? Because you've got buildings that are set back. And then right on the line itself, the actual demarcation line, you've got a series of buildings that uh, where the in- interior of the building, there will be a different color of tile. that tells you if you step on this tile, you're in North Korea. If you're on this tile, you're in South Korea. And uh, you can have joint use of the buildings, but you don't have to go in there, hand on your pistol. You have to go lock the door on the northern side and then then retreat back and you clear it and it's safe. So he, he walked in between the two buildings and the first, uh, and he's got a camera. So he, he tells the North Korean kid, 
stand here and I'm going to get a picture of you because there was a South Korean kid and an American kid in the background. He says, I'm going to get a picture of you with them in the background. And then I want you to take a picture of me with them in the background. And uh, so the first frame shows the North Korean kid standing there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the next, then he has the camera to him. And the next frame is him going. <laughs> And so he runs across the street and he says, I'm defecting. And uh, so the North Korean kid st- pulls his pistol out and starts chasing him because he's in trouble now. Absolutely. And, uh, so now you got a North Korean soldier south of the military demarcation line in South Korea with a pistol drawn. So the uh, the kids in the street open up and, uh, and drop him. And uh, so then the guard posts open up on each other. And uh, I think the the so the South the North Korean kid dies on the spot. Um, South Korean kid dies on the spot. Uh, the American kid that's in the street he makes it. Uh, he's he's shot in the throat, but he makes it all the way back to the uh, to the um, the guard shack. And then and then it's just it's just pandemonium. Uh, the, the both the checkpoints unload on each other, and uh, which happens somewhat frequently. And uh, you know, all along that border, you know, there's always uh, you, know, it, it, you can. You could be in cleaning your weapon with an accidental discharge and then the, the two sides will open up and then they go get on the loudspeakers, expect an apology. And the United Nations guys go out there and have an investigation. But for this one, they actually sent a squad in to find this, this defector. And uh, so we responded by sending our quick reaction force platoon up there. And uh, it, it just happened that, um, you know, we were in, uh, I think we we're in the chow hall down at Kitty Hawk was about a kilometer south. And uh, one of the Korean soldiers came in and said, hey, Sergeant Lam, um, there's, you know, Captain Misazawa is in his civilian clothes, but he's got his battle rattle on and he's down at the tactical operations center. And uh, there's something going on up in the, in the truce village. And I said, yeah, it's either that or he's going to, he's going to, he's going to react us, which he always used to do. He, he wanted us on those trucks within, within minutes. And, uh, so, so I said, go ahead and have everybody load the trucks and then I'll go down and see what's going on. And if he says, if he tells us to load the trucks, I want to be able to say, yeah, we did that already. And, uh, so yeah, but it, like, I got in there and look on his face was like load trucks. I said, yeah, they're, they're loaded. They're done. And then he, then he gives me the, uh, Hey, there's their shots fired at the truce village. We've got men down. There's a Soviet defector. There's a North, the North Koreans in the South. And, uh, we need to secure the, uh, the Soviet defector. We need to get, uh, get our wounded. And uh, we need to push the North Koreans out. And I mean, that, that was, that was about what it was. And he said, you know, load trucks and, uh, and move. And I say, hey, the platoon sergeant, the platoon leader aren't here, you know, cause they, we were going to do a night combat, uh, ambush patrol. And they were down at four Papa one, which was the artillery base, you know, doing the, uh, doing the coordinations for our artillery right. fires. And he says, I know there, uh, there are, he says, I sent my driver and, uh, and my Jeep down there. Cause back in that day, you didn't have cell phones. And uh, so if you were outside the, the distance of your radio handset, which it was in your Jeep, then you're not hearing what the, what the boss is trying to send. So he dispatched his runner. And uh, so he sent uh, that. That's why I love this man. He sent um, a bunch of sergeants and privates into combat and said, I will catch up with you. And uh, which he did. I mean, he, uh, he, we, we got there, we, we got out, we got into our, uh, our skirmish, you know, our, our, our order of movement. And bam, he's there and he goes, all right, I'm taking these guns and I'm going up on the uh, on the, the high ground, the, the helicopter landing zone, because he was able to, to, to plug the flank, tie in with our flank. And then he's got uh, machine guns that can overwatch the truce village while we started our maneuver, you know, kind of an end run around to the left. And uh, you know, we, we ended up coming up, coming up on them. And just uh, at the point where they had uh, where they had set up like their linear defense, we, we hit them on the flank. And uh, so now you don't have to go force on force. You just start rolling them up, you know, and uh, you shoot one, he's down, you shoot the next one. And they finally gave up. We, uh, we had uh, run them out of ammunition. There was no way for them to resupply. We, uh, we, we came up, uh, our SOP was, uh, was a double basic load. So we were carrying about 400 rounds of ammunition to their, you know, probably half that. Well, with everything that happened, what was interesting to me, first off, th- this incident happens between a North Korean guy, a Russian, there's an American in the background, there's a South Korean in the background, 
But as this all unfolds and everything happens, they actually, the North Korean press secretary said that it was a brazen criminal act by the Americans that did this. And I mean, to start off the whole thing, the Americans had nothing to do with it. It was just some guy standing in the background of a picture of a guy running off. And we got blamed uh, for well, it. Well, you know, it, it. The funny, the bad thing was, was the, because uh, it kept escalating. So, so you, you said it was you know, two guys and it was four guys. And so we had, uh, they sent about a 40 man platoon in to start beating the bushes. So we, we then responded with a 40 man platoon. And uh, when anything goes like that, I mean, it's all rote memorization. And uh, I mean, these kids would practice that, uh, you know, day after day after day. And so the rest of our battalion, was was coming up and occupying battle positions. The uh, they have a battalion in the demilitarized zone, and they're all on five ton trucks sitting on pallets of ammunition, and uh, and they're beating the side rails in like this berserker rage because they're fixing to go get their gun on. So these guys are coming up the MSR, you know our guys are in battle positions. We're up there slugging it out, and they're doing the same thing on the northern side, and uh, because they're uh, they're lining up right on the. Uh, on the bridge of no return and right behind their, uh, they call it the engine got, and uh, they've got about a battalion. So, so very rapidly, we've got almost uh, four battalions um, heading towards each other and uh, you know, two on either side. And that's when the, uh, the joint duty officer came out. Cause we'd gotten to the point where, um, you know, they, they were, the, the, the fight was done. You know, we had already secured the defector and he was already heading to heading to Seoul and, uh, you know, their, their, their fight was done. I mean, they had probably four or five wounded uh, or dead. And uh, it was hard to tell. There, there was a lot of blood. And uh, so I told my, uh, one of my, my fire, alpha fire team leader, I said, hey, you know, Lee, tell them that uh, they need to surrender or else we're going to have to kill them. And uh, so he told them, uh, you know, hey, surrender. And they did. I mean, to our, to our uh, amazement, because we'd always heard, you know, about the North Korean soldiers, they would never surrender. And, uh they did, man, hands up and uh, we're done. And so it, right at that moment, when we're going out to actually search them and treat them. The, uh, the joint duty officer comes in and he, uh, he stands between the two forces and uh, he says, hey, Sergeant, I need you to move your, uh, your troops back to that last cover and concealed position. And then he turns to the Korean guys and says, I need you to get your dead, get your wounded, and get your ass out of South Korea. And, uh, and he basically pushed the two sides apart. And we find out later it was because these two battalions, two on either side, are, are, are actually at the outer the outer limits of the truce village, and it was fixing to go battalion on battalion. And uh, and I mean, so and that's how I mean, it was just minutes. Well, well, and that you know, two things pop up in my head when you talk about this. When you say you have an officer that sends a bunch of sergeants and privates into battle, says I'll catch up with you. That's the perfect setup for the next part of your career. I mean, that's special forces telling them you guys go get your job done and, and, and sergeants being in charge and everyone doing just what they needed to do that, that, um, I, that, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, that, that solitary, you know, where they know what they're doing, they can, they can, um, work outside the, the lines that they need to that shows up. And then number two, when you get down there and this happens, it's got to be going through your brain like, oh, shit, we might have another Korean War off of what we're doing right now. I mean, that that has to be a, a factor going into your head. Yeah, but, but when, you, when you're when you're in the moment, though, the uh, you know, I mean, adrenaline rush and everybody's, all, all the blood's going to your eyes. And I mean, you're uh, everything slows down to that. Uh, you know, so, so it's out, almost develops almost a cadence or, or just a different hue. Then uh, you know, you're, you're just thinking. You know, I, at least I was at the time. I'm just thinking, you know, at, at that tactical level. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to move a machine gun up. And because uh, I had fired the guy, I'd question his manhood. And because uh, I'm, I'm calling I'm calling him to get his machine gun up. And uh, and he says, I'm coming, Sergeant. I can hear him rustling in the bushes and uh, and, and he's not coming. So I, I call him again and uh, I actually fired him. I said, you're fired. Get a man behind that gun. Get that gun up here. And what I didn't know was that the lieutenant was grabbing him by this, uh, his load carrying equipment and slinging him down and telling him, stay down, shut up. Cause he, he already knows that we, we gotta, we gotta break this contact. Cause again, not every man had a radio. And, uh, it, but, but after that, I started carrying a radio. I actually drew a, a second radio from supply. And so I would carry a prick 77 with me as the squad leader. Cause we'd gotten so far out in front of them that we, we didn't, uh, we didn't know that they'd stop. 
you know, Rick, that's, that's quick. Yeah, Rick, that's not a small radio. You act like yeah. you just put like a Motorola on you. A Brick 77 is not yeah. a small yeah. radio. I, I kept that with me for almost the rest of my career until they issued one. <laughs> we don't, we, so much like the old uh, the old Vietnam codgers in in, uh, uh, in the National Guard said, go to the Rangers. The uh, I'm, I'm probably 90 days out from, from PCS, and, you know, for permit change cessation going back to the States. And uh, my sergeant major, who was a special forces guy, Glenn Forsythe, and uh, he calls in. There was like four to six of us, and he sits us down and he says, "I see the way that you guys interact with the Koreans because we, we we actually lived eight same room, same barracks, and uh, I was just fascinating the, the just the blend of cultures." And uh, so he says, "I see the way that you guys interact with the with the Koreans." He said, "Your next your next duties, you know, your next stop is special forces." And I was like, oh, come on, I'm going to go back to the Rangers. And he goes, no, he said, your next stop is special forces. He said, the recruiter's coming up and you're going to do the PT test, the swim test, the road march and the five mile run. And, and then he says, I know all your scores and I know what you guys can score. And he says, so nobody's sandbagging. He said, you will do your best. And uh, your, your next stop is the Q course. And uh, so that's how I got Shanghai to, uh, to go to the Q course. Well, I, to wrap up Korea, I want to, I actually have the state department's comment on this incident. And I want to show the listeners, the difference in guys like you that were on the ground and what the government officials did at the time. So they said the state department said today that the Russian was alive and well, and that United States officials have been in contact with him. Administration officials have said the defector had asked for asylum to the United States and that he would probably get it. A State Department spokesman said that according to reports from the embassy in Seoul, the man was pursued by 20 to 30 North Korean soldiers who opened fire. So you get this huge split in, it's a criminal act by the Americans. The Americans are saying 20 to 30 Koreans chase this guy across. And no one really gets to the point where the guy goes, hey, take a picture of me, and then jumped across the line. No <laughs> one, nowhere in there. And it goes back to that thing you said about the media, where unless you're really there, you, you're you not real sure what happened. Yeah, I've actually got the, because uh, we, we recovered the camera. So I've actually got the, the picture. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so they tell you you're going to special forces uh and this is where we're going to wrap up this first part of the uh conversation that we're having then we'll jump to the second part but i want to wrap it up by talking about special force qualification now when you sent me notes on this you said i selected panama panama and panama as my three choices for assignment and i got panama first off i want to know after being with the rangers and doing everything that you did with them, uh, doing everything in, in big army units that you were in, going to special forces, what changed for you? Why was it better? Uh, did you think it was better? And then why Panama? Yeah, it was uh, you know, in the in the Q course. I ran into a uh, he was a so special forces. You, you got the, the guys are on the A team. And then, uh, but there's also, there's logistics guys, there's communicators, there's cooks, there's, you know, so all the guys that, that, that help make the A-team successful. So we had had one of the communicators that, uh, who was, you know, worked in the combo shop, but had not gone to the Q course. Yeah, he was like the backside support uh, for the, you know, for, for the entire unit. And uh, so he raised his hand, he says, I want to go be a special forces communicator, which is, you know, the combo man on an A-team. So he had to go through the school to do that. And uh, so he was coming up from Panama, going through the school and going back. And so he's telling us the Panama stories. And uh, he's saying, yeah, you know, they're in El Salvador. They're working in El Salvador, you know, Nicaragua. They're doing this. Uh, so he's, he's telling us that uh, that is probably the best, single best place to be. Because yeah, we're at peacetime, right? So the only thing going is, um, is, is you know, the counter guerrilla stuff. And, I mean, they're, you know, they're hunting down Che Guevara. They're doing, doing all those uh they're doing great things down in Latin America. And so I'm like, Oh, I want to go there. And, uh, so you get three choices, you know, you say, I want to go to, you know, first group, third group or 10th group or, or whatever. Uh, and so I, I just put uh, all three was, was Panama because that's where I really, really, really wanted to go and ended up getting it. And, uh, it, uh, did it pan out for you? Was it? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it did. I, mean, I, I figured God, you so would the, say that. You know, like lifelong friends. Cause it was, um, 
it was my very first A team, you know, that I was assigned to. And uh, so you always remember that one. And, uh, cause I, I think I was, I was standing by this. So I first, so I go down to Panama and, uh, I don't know why, but they, they sent me like on the 23rd of December. And, uh, so I left my wife in the States and, uh, we, we had a newborn. And uh, so I go down to sign in. And, uh, so when I get down there, they're all on, uh, <laughs> I'm in the replacement detachment over on the Pacific side. And, uh, they say, Hey, we're closing down for, for Christmas leave. And I'm like, man, I should just stay in the States for, if I'm going to come down here and they said, uh, if you don't have somebody from your unit to pick you up, you're going to have to go over to this little you know, hotel that was on the base, stay there for two weeks. Then we'll reopen. We'll get you processed and, uh, and we'll send you out to your unit. And so right then this Jeep pulls up and this guy steps out and he's got a parrot on his shoulder. <laughs> and, uh, it's Clark Jelson. He's coming over from seventh and he goes, anybody over here going to three, seven? Cause I was on the Pacific side it was where the repo depot is. And, uh, third of the seventh was over on, uh, on the Atlantic side. And I said, yeah, I'm going. He goes, we'll get your bags and throw them in the back and uh, we'll take you over there. And, uh, so <laughs> and again, the whole parrot thing <laughs> and, uh, we're driving over there. And, uh, so I get in there and, uh, they said, Hey, we don't, you know, the, the battalion's on leave. So, uh, you can stay here. There's, uh, this, this guy here, Tripper, he's, um, he's in El Salvador, so you can stay in his room. And uh, there, there's a clean poncho liner on the bed. There's beer in the refrigerator. And, uh, and uh, so I'm staying in another guy's room cause he's down in El Salvador. And, uh, so there's a knock on the door, a dude comes by and, uh, it's, it's, uh, Tony Layden who had been one of the instructors in the Q course. He goes, man, I'm glad you made it. Uh, he says, you want to go on a ruck march? And uh, it's like, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, sure. So uh, we get these rucksacks and we're out. You know, we do a quick six mile up, 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 up a hill and around and come back. And then he's, uh, so I go, go to uh, back to the room. And the guy comes in, he says, hey, uh, you know how to drive a stick shift? I said, yeah. He said, well, none of us know how to drive a stick shift because so-and-so who's uh, in the States, uh, he left us his keys, but none of us know how to drive a stick shift and they're having a Christmas party out at the beach. And uh, so we're going to, that's all that, that was, just, that was my first night in special forces was, uh, you know, it was, it was just so bizarre. Yeah. You know, no kidding. March, taking dudes out to the beach, you know, bringing, uh, uh, bringing them back. And uh, so I, I, I started doing PT with the, uh, with the dive team. Cause I'm thinking I'm going to be on the scuba team. And, uh, so I go in the, the, and I'm standing at the, the desk getting ready to go see the Sergeant major and Chris Zetz, um, comes over and he looks at the Ranger tab and he goes, you a real Ranger. So well, if I was in one of the battalions, if that's what you mean, and he goes, okay. Yeah. He says, you're coming to us. Cause, uh, cause we we're all Rangers on, uh, on, 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 uh, 95, 794, I think it was. And, uh, so I, I was going to go to the scuba team. At least that's what I thought, right? And he goes, "Oh, oh, okay. So you're too good for us." And uh, <laughs> so I go in to see the sergeant major, who Chris had probably gone to see already. And uh, I, I end up going to uh, 94, and uh, I mean, one of the best teams in that whole battalion. And um, every one of those guys I still converse with today, and uh, we still, uh, we you know, we still, we still meet. In fact, we'll uh, they're coming down here, I think, uh, in February for a dinner but yeah it was just um, the the team sergeant hard as nails you know, very just competent you know john humphreys and uh, just a, an awesome awesome team because i i had um, i had lost my daughter because you know, my, my wife came down and uh, we had a we had a new new uh, newborn she was only 15 months old and uh, she caught influenza and she she passed away there in panama and uh so i mean every guy on that team came up and just gave me a thousand dollars and they said, pay it back if you want. If you don't, we don't care. And uh, you just go, go bury your dead and lick your wounds. And, and uh, wow. so you know, we, we went back to the States, you know, buried our child. And, and uh, I'd actually, because um, they'll, they'll send you anywhere in the States uh, if you lose somebody overseas. And uh, so I had had a, uh, uh, my sister was a teacher. And she said, go see the ROTC guys there at the uh, University of Kansas. And uh, so I go to the University of Kansas, and they said, "Yeah, you could, we can get you here." 
and uh, and I mean, he actually gave me the keys to a truck. He gave me my first uh, you know, my first stack of stuff because they had, they had like four or five satellite campuses, and uh, we're gonna live uh, right there on uh, oh, that uh, that old Custer base and uh, Fenton Family Housing and uh, Leavenworth, and uh, so I had to go back down to Panama to clear. And because, uh, you know, I'm only talking about maybe two weeks have elapsed. And uh, so I had to go back down to Panama and clear because we still had a house and quarters and everything to pack up. And so I go, I roll in and they said, hey, Rick, we just got these new weapons in. This is my team. Right. And uh, and we know that you were waiting on these weapons because we had the M16s and now they have the little uh, M4s. They just got brand new M4s in. And uh, so John goes, um, you're, you're a weapons guy. Could you stay just another week or so? and put us through the paces with these, with these guns. We want to jump them. Uh, we want to do a, 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 a totally black drop zone, um, you know, with, with the jump master we're in, uh, we're in night vision. We're going to mark the drop zone with infrared so that there's no, there's no ambient light. So we want to jump them. Then we're going to swim them across the Chagras. We'll take them down to, uh, the, the, there was a big rifle Pina range. Uh, we'll do a raid and then we'll move into an ambush position and uh, we'll have a, uh, they'll pull a target sled through. We'll do the ambush and then we'll walk them back. And, uh, but, you know, we need to, we need to do the, you know, how to load, unload, reduce stoppage, clear, do all the range work, get them all zeroed up. And then we're going to go take them out on this three day, you know, uh, live fire. And, uh, so, so we, we take about five days, right. To do this. And I can remember coming back from the team, you know, from the exercise and I'm in the team room and we're all grungy, you know, we got, you know, four layers of camouflage paint on us. And, and, uh, and I, I just broke down and started crying. And I'm like, I can't leave these guys. So I go over to the phone and call my wife and I say, hey, get, get on the first thing smoking. You know, tell the colonel I'm sorry. And, uh, well, we're staying. And uh, so we, we stayed there like six years. And uh, yeah, cause the, 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 the support was not at home at that point. You know, the support was you know, in Panama on that team. And, and I mean, that, that's an A team. Absolutely. So I, I got to ask, though. When you tell your wife that, is there any, any friction, any, or does she just know, like, you're right. This is the family. Yeah, I, I think so. Because the, um, yeah, she's a little Korean gal. I met her in, in Korea. And, uh, so yeah, she's, she's foreign wherever she's at, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, so she could either be, you know, foreign in, in, uh, Kansas or Iowa uh, or, or down with the, uh, where, where she's just another shade of green in, uh, in the military. And, and uh, you know, good. being with you, I guess would be a big thing too. Well, yeah. Well, I'd hope. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for part two, where we ask her. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And we had an international wives club. I mean, I, I lived on Fort Sherman. And, uh, so a typical Saturday was that the, the guys would come out we get dive tanks and then we go, uh, get lobsters or, uh, uh, crab or fish. And then the, then the girls would show up. And one of the, one of the gals was, um, uh, was Italian. You know, they had been married uh, when he was previously assigned in, uh, Vincenza. Uh, we had a, a Colombian gal, we had a, uh, Panamanian gal. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they would come in with, uh, and then a Korean gal. So, so we, I mean, our, our team parties were, were like international food nights and uh, we just provide the, uh, we just provide the fish. Wow. So this is amazing. So one last question before we end this one, this is, uh, this is of course before just cause, uh, have, have you seen Stu yet? Have you come across him? Well, uh, yeah, we, we, I was just with him. Uh, we had his birthday, his 60th, uh, no, 60th no, no, no. I mean, oh, 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 you mean in Panama, right? Yeah. Have you come oh, yeah, across yeah, him yeah. in Panama? Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, he was one of those wild eyed, I mean, you know, he's just a big guy, right? He's just one of those big wild eyed football playing officers, you know, wouldn't get a haircut, wouldn't wear, wouldn't wear his headgear, was always in trouble. And, that, uh, that's what he told major, me. <laughs> the Star major would, uh, uh, we had the uh, Kenny McMullen, an old Sante Raider. You know, he'd go over there and, and, you know, Kenny was, was a shorter guy, but he'd, he'd put his arm up around Stu and, Come here, son. <laughs> Take him under his wing, and uh, you might make a good officer one day. But here's here's what you need to do. 
<laughs> yeah, that was his big thing when him and I talked about Panama. He said that he had the bandana on and the long hair and the the must. And then he uh, he he had told me that he lost his patrol cap and those were expensive. He had a special one over there and he had lost it, so he had long hair hanging out and everything. So that uh, we'll we'll definitely get into more of that. But let's wrap it up for this time, guys. This is just the beginning. We've got Just Cause. We've got Gothic Serpent coming up. We have a ton of stuff. Remember, uh, if you want some more of me other than here, go to Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast, Facebook at the DTD podcast, YouTube at the DTD podcast. Remember, guys, the best stories are true and you come here every week because we give them to you. Make sure you stay tuned for part two of this conversation with Rick Lamb. We'll catch you on the next one. We'll see you guys.